Ethernet Fundamentals. So, <laughs> with Ethernet Fundamentals, we're going to talk all about Ethernet. Do you guys remember what Ethernet was? 802.3. Got to remember that for the exam. 802.3 is Ethernet. So, in the early computer days, there were many different types of network technologies out there competing for a portion of the market share. We had Ethernet, we had Token Ring, Fiber Distributed Data Interface, FIDI, uh, and others were all fighting for dominance. Uh, what ended up happening though was pretty much Ethernet is the one who won. Okay, so when we talk about layer one inside of our local area networks, what are we usually using? Almost always it's Ethernet. Okay, whether that's Ethernet over fiber or Ethernet over Wi Fi or Ethernet over Cat5 cabling or Cat6 cabling, it's all pretty much Ethernet with the way that we frame our data. And so, due to Ethernet's pop popularity, it's really important that we understand how Ethernet works. And for the exam, it's important to know how Ethernet works. So, uh, Ethernet was originally run over coaxial cables. Okay, I mentioned in a, uh, previously that we had 10 base 5 and 10 base 2, which was called thick net and thin net. Uh, I have a picture of it there on the board for you. Uh, thick net was a thicker cable; it could go longer distances. In fact, it was 10 base 5, the 5 standing for 500 meters. Okay, uh, maximum speed on this was 10 megabits per second. Thin net, on the other hand, because it was thinner, couldn't go nearly as far. It was affectionately called 10 base 2, the 2 for being about 200 meters. In reality, you could get about 185 meters. So 10 base 2 is 185 meters, again 10 megabits per second. Uh, Ethernet changed over to twisted pair cabling, though, with what was called CAT3, uh, or 10 base T wiring. And 10 base T, the T was for twisted pair. Uh, it was originally UTP, unshielded twisted pair. And its maximum speed was 10 megabits per second, just like the other ones. But it, could all, but it could only go 100 meters. Now, the reason why it became very popular is because it was very cheap, inexpensive, and easy to work with. Um, and as we got better in our CAT3 went to CAT5 cabling, we increased the speed up to 100 megabits per second. Um, but that's an example of what those three look like, our thick net, our thin net, and our 10 base T, also known as CAT3 cabling. So with Ethernet, we have to determine how we're going to access our network. There's two different ways to do it. One is we can be very orderly and organized and be deterministic. Uh, things like the token ring were deterministic. They would actually get an electronic token that they would pass around, and whoever had the token, it was their turn to talk. It's very organized, very orderly, and it worked very well. Instead, Ethernet is contention-based. It's more chaotic. It allows transmission pretty much whenever you want. Okay, But the problem with that is if two of you talk at the same time, you talk over each other, and neither of you gets heard. And so then you have to retransmit. It's kind of like if you've ever walked down a hallway and somebody walks at you and you start doing that little side to side dance and you got to figure out who's going to go first. That's the idea here, right? It's a little bit chaotic. Uh, and Ethernet is a good example of a contention based networking access. So what Ethernet had to do was, a, was compensate for this fact that there was no order. And the way they did that was with, with what is called Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detection, also known as CSMA CD. Okay? Uh, it is carrier sense, and what that means is it listens to the wire first and tries to verify whether or not it's busy or not. If it doesn't hear anything, it tries to access it. Multiple access, meaning lots of devices can do it at the same time, but if too many do, they'll end up having a collision. And then the last thing is collision detection, and what that means is it can determine if it actually stepped on somebody else's transmission. So if two devices did transmit at the same time, a collision happens, they'll actually back off, wait a random amount of time, and then try again. And I'll show you what this looks like here in a second. So, with Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detection, we have all these different Ethernet devices all on a shared bus. These could just as easily be on a star network on a hub, it would work the same way. But for the example, we're going to use a bus. Okay? I have five different devices there that want to communicate. What happens if two of them talk at the same time? Uh-oh, we had a collision. So what ends up happening is they're going to choose a random back off time. Let's say the guy on the left chose 150, the guy on the right chose 50 milliseconds. They wait, it's been 50 milliseconds, the guy on the right is going to transmit again, and off he goes, no problem. The guy on the left still had another 100 milliseconds to go. When his timer's up, he'll try transmitting as well. And hopefully by then, the guy on the right is done. If not, we have another collision, and then what happens? We'd start all over again. Okay, So this works pretty well. The only problem is if you have too many devices, you're going to have more collisions, and then you start getting to the point where there's so many collisions, nothing's really getting done, because there's so much back off timer. And that's the problem we have with hubs. Uh, we talk about this as a collision domain. How many devices are on a shared bus or a shared network segment? 
We already talked about the fact that hubs, they all share one domain. Wireless access points, they all share one domain. Switches, though, don't do that, and that's where we get a big benefit. So our collision domains are comprised of everything that is sharing that network segment. If you're dealing with thick net or thin net, it's all about who's on the same cable. Everyone on that cable is in one domain. If you're dealing with CAT3 or above, 10 base T or above, everybody who's on the same hub is on the same domain. And these devices will operate at what's called half duplex uh, when they're connected to a hub, which is a layer one device, because they have to listen before they can transmit. Think of a walkie-talkie, that is half duplex. You can talk or you can listen, you can't do both. As opposed to your phone, which is full duplex, where you can talk and listen. And if you have a mother who's like mine, when you're trying to talk, she's not listening, she's talking too. But you both can talk, but nobody can hear each other, right? Um, but essentially with full duplex, that's what goes on, is you can talk and listen at the same time. With half duplex, you gotta talk or listen, you can't do both. And when you're operating on a hub, you're operating at half duplex, which also means you're operating at half the speed, because you can only do one or the other, not both. So when we deal with a switch, though, our switches actually increase our scalability of our network and performance by creating multiple collision domains. The nice thing about a switch is every single port on every switch is considered its own collision domain. So if you're on a switch, you can't possibly have a collision. Why? Because you are on your own port, and he's on his own port, and she's on her own port. And so we're all talking ourselves, and because there is no chance of collisions, guess what else we get to do? We can do full duplex. We can talk and listen at the same time, because I can talk and the switch can listen, and I can listen while the switch is talking, and there's no problem because of this different collision domain on each port. So this gives you a lot more speed over a hub because you're not going to have any collisions, you're not going to be rebroadcasting, and you're, and you're going to end up operating at full duplex. So speed limitations. Uh, our bandwidth is our measure of how many bits a network can transmit in one second of time. It initially was measured in bits per second. Because we have gone much faster now, we've gone into megabits per second, which is thousands of bits, uh, excuse me, millions of bits per second, and we've also gone into gigabits, which is billions of bits per second. Uh, the type of cable you have is going to determine the capacity of your network, okay? So if you look there on the left, um, I have Ethernet, fast Ethernet, gigabit, 10 gigabit, and 100 gigabit. These are the types of networks we're talking about here, and they're determined based on those bandwidth capacities. Ethernet, 10 megabits per second, is our old Category 3 cabling. Fast Ethernet, we're dealing with Cat5e, where we got 100 meg excuse me, Cat5, which was 100 megabits per second. Gigabit was Cat5e and Cat6. 10 gigabit was 6a and 7. And 100 gigabit, we don't have yet on copper cabling. We only have it on fiber cable at this point. Distance limitations. So here we have our distance limitations. Um, this is not a complete or exhaustive list of all the cable types that are out there, but it's a good, uh, a good little chart to help you out. Um, the different types of cable are going to determine the distance you can have. So the nice thing is we already talked about uh, our, our base 5, 10 base 5, which is our thick net at 500 meters. We talked about 10 base 2, which is just under 200 meters at 185. All of our base T connections, whether they're T, TX, or 1000 base TX, which is all of our Cat3, Cat5, Cat6, Cat7 stuff, it's all going to be 100 meters because it's copper cabling. Once we go into fiber, we start getting into longer distances, 5 uh, kilometers, 10 kilometers, 70 kilometers, and above. Um, the big thing, you don't need to know the fiber distances, they're not going to ask you that, but you definitely do need to know your distances for 10 base 5, 10 base 2, and anything that's 10 base T something, T or TX, uh, both of those are 100 meters, okay? Um, the other thing you need to know from this slide is sometimes they like to ask the fiber question of is it single mode or is it multi-mode, okay? And the way I like to teach people this one is I like to tell you there's a little saying called S is not single, okay? So if you notice here on our fiber connections, after the dash, you have LX, LH, ZX. Um, there are literally like 30 or 40 of these, if you look at the textbook, that show you all of the different fiber ones. And if you look through all of them, if they have an S something at the end of it, like SX or SH or something like that, it means it's a multi-mode fiber. If it has anything else, it's a single-mode fiber. So S is not single. So if you see single, it's multi-mode. If you see an S, it's, it's a multi-mode. Anytime you see something, what I'm talking about here is, like here, we have a ZX. 
Therefore, it's multi-mode. Uh, therefore, it's single mode because there's no S in there. Here's a, a LH. Therefore, it's single mode because there's no S in there. If there was an S there, it would be a multi-mode fiber. So it's, 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 it's one of those in-depth questions that sometimes they like to ask. And if you can remember, S is not single. Anytime you see S, it's multi-mode. It's a shortcut. And that's Ethernet fundamentals.